The nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant seven years ago was second only to Chernobyl in terms of impact. The meltdown of three nuclear reactors released massive amounts of radiation, much of that into the Pacific Ocean. Years later, that's made its way to the Canadian Pacific coast. Joining us now to explain whether it's as dangerous as it sounds, in Victoria, British Columbia via Skype, Jay Cullen, professor at the University of Victoria's School of Earth and Ocean Sciences. He's also head of Fukushima Inform. That's a research effort monitoring the arrival of Fukushima contamination into Canadian waters. And Jay Cullen, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How's it going? It's going well, Steve. Thanks. Good. Thanks for joining us. I wonder if we could start, just for those who may need a bit of a refresher, to have you uh, remind us uh, briefly of the events that transpired seven years ago. Well, one of the largest earthquakes that we've actually measured in, in the modern era, a magnitude 9 earthquake, struck off the coast of Japan. And in response to that shaking, the nuclear reactors that were operating at the Fukushima Dai Daiichi plant went into shutdown. But in that state, they still must keep their fuel cool. And that's normally done by circulating water with pumps uh, around the fuel. And power to the plant uh, from outside the plant was uh, cut by the shaking of the earthquake. Uh, and emergency generators came online to keep the fuel cool. Uh, unfortunately, 45 minutes after uh, the shaking stopped, the tsunami wave, uh, approximately 15 meters high at this part of the Japanese coast, inundated the plant and, and destroyed those generators, uh, causing the fuel to overheat, to melt down, and explosions, uh, in effect, destroyed the outer buildings in three of the reactors, uh, and large amounts of radioactive contamination were released both to the atmosphere and to the North Pacific Ocean as a result. And the picture we just saw, I gather, is of a village nearby that was quite decimated by the tidal wave. Is that right? By the tsunami? That's correct. And, and given recent events here on the West Coast, it, it reminds us that the disaster was, was quite extreme for the Japanese people. And in fact, the tsunami was responsible for uh, on the order of, of 16,000 uh, deaths and, and almost 3,000 people missing from that tsunami. So the Japanese people and the coastal communities there are still recovering. Jay, we're going to bring up some animation right now, which kind of tracks the traveling of the radiation initially from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, which of course released the largest ever unplanned discharges of radioactivity into the Pacific Ocean. 90% apparently of its radiation went into the water. And then of course the current takes it all the way over to this country's west coast, where it was first noticed, I gather, in June of 2013, which is when you began to track it. And I'm wondering how scared Canadians were at the time, a few years ago, when they got the news that there was this radiation in the water off their coast. Well, Canadians were, were rightly concerned about the potential risk uh, associated with these artificial radioactive elements in the environment. They shouldn't be there. And at sufficient concentration, if the levels are high enough, both in the seawater um, and in marine organisms that people rely on for food, um, the ionizing radiation doses that they, they can experience can, can cause health problems. And so uh, I was getting lots of questions both from, from family initially and, and from friends uh, about what we could expect in terms of contamination and the timing of the arrival of that contamination uh, due to the ocean transport that you just described. So you started to sample the water, I guess? Yeah, so um, I, along with, with colleagues in the federal government, so both Health Canada uh, was making measurements of contamination in the atmosphere, and my colleagues in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, they were making measurements off the coast of British Columbia, about 1,500 kilometers offshore, looking over the horizon, if you, if you wish, uh, to look for what we could expect uh, to affect our coastal waters as as the contamination was transported across the Pacific. Uh, maybe a silly question here, but do you, do you have to wear special equipment to make sure the water doesn't get on you? Well, at the levels that we're, we're finding related to the Fukushima disaster itself, um, we don't have concerns uh, of, of uh, encountering acutely toxic levels that could cause us to get sick. The levels, the peak levels, in fact, that we've, we've measured offshore that we can expect from the disaster are about a factor of a thousand, one thousandth, of the level that's uh, allowed in our drinking water before it starts to become a health concern. So we can detect these levels because uh, we have very sensitive methods to detect them, but the levels are really quite low compared to levels known 
to cause significant health risk, either to animals that live in the ocean or to human beings who, who use the ocean for recreation or for food. Having said that, you were looking for something called cesium-134. What is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, cesium-134 is a very useful element from our point of view in terms of monitoring. It's, a, it's an isotope that, that doesn't exist uh, naturally. It only exists because human beings, uh, for good or bad, have figured out how to split atoms. And it has a half-life, um, the time it takes for half of the number of cesium atoms that you have uh, to decay away uh, to something else. Uh, its half-life is two years long. And so what that means is that if we look at all the other major sources of radioactive contamination to the environment because of human beings, like Chernobyl you mentioned, and radioactive uh, uh, fallout from nuclear weapons testing that was occurring in the atmosphere during uh, the 20th century, um, those events are, are far enough in the past that all the cesium-134 from those sources has decayed away in the environment. And if we detect cesium-134 today, we know that that sample, whether it's seawater or fish that lives in the Pacific Ocean, has been affected by the Fukushima disaster. And, and so it's like an, a fingerprint for us. A fingerprint. Okay. So what ultimately was your level of concern about the levels of cesium-134 you found off the coast of BC? Well, initially, before we had good information and before the international scientific community was making measurements and monitoring and making that information public, and the project that I run started to do so, uh, we really didn't know what to expect. And the early days were, were, were really quite stressful and concerning and, and wondering what would happen and what the risk would be on, on our West Coast here in Canada. But as we started making measurements and, and others started making measurements, we, we started to see the levels that were likely to exist in our part of the Pacific. And as I stated before, the maximum levels that we've seen in seawater, which ultimately controls how much gets into fish or whales or shellfish that we might eat from the Pacific Ocean, um, those levels in seawater are about, uh, about a factor of 10 lower than what we actually saw in the North Pacific at the height of those nuclear weapons tests that were happening in the late 50s and early 60s. So the levels are lower than they have been historically. And, and the amount that we see from Fukushima, um, again, don't approach levels that health physicists, people who study the impact of radiation on living organisms, uh, know to be dangerous or know to represent a significant risk to either animal or human health. Okay, well, you, you've anticipated my next question, which was, okay, fish, safe, how about humans? Well, again, we, uh, we've been measuring the amount of contamination that we see in common foodstuffs uh, that we take from the Pacific Ocean. So Pacific salmon in particular, because they're both economically and culturally important to Canadians, um, and shellfish as well. We've been making measurements to look for this contamination from Fukushima and looking what levels we're actually seeing in the organisms. And in the Pacific salmon, we haven't seen a change in, in the levels of these artificial, these human-made radioisotopes in the fish uh, when we compare the levels that we saw before F Fukushima occurred. And so the ionizing radiation dose that a consumer of those fish will actually uh, experience because of the Fukushima contamination is very small compared to uh, the exposures that they receive from other sources, other foods, uh, naturally occurring radioisotopes in the air uh, that we breathe, the food that we eat, and the water that we drink. Now, one of the difficulties of the position that you have on this, having studied it, and come up with this empirically provable evidence is that you're fighting uh, one of those great scientific cartoon shows called The Simpsons. And I'm gonna put up a picture here. This is Blinky, the three-eyed mutated radioactive fish from that long-running sitcom. Um, <laughs> his pond sits just outside the nuclear power plant in Springfield. This is obviously an exaggeration, but, mm -hmm. um, but that's out there. The notion that this, you know, that, that icon is out there. Uh, do you have to, what do you have to do to convince the public that's, that's not about to show up on the coast of British Columbia? Well, first of all, I don't think I can say a bad word about The Simpsons, but uh, your, your point's well taken. Uh, there is a lot of uh, misinformation or um, exaggerated risk associated with ionizing radiation and, and the risk that it presents to human beings. Uh, because of human activities and because of naturally occurring radioisotopes in the environment. Uh, radiation is a difficult thing to talk about because we can't see it, we can't taste it, we can't smell it. Um, and the history of, of nuclear weapons and, and the fear that they impose on people and the fact that government and industry are all involved in nuclear technology 
for a lot of people, that combination leads to distrust and, and fear and, and ultimately misunderstanding. And one of the reasons why I and the other scientists and our citizen science volunteers and non-governmental organizations who work together as part of the INFORM project to get good information out to the public, uh, one of our motivations is to, to counteract that misunderstanding um, through uh, scientific literacy and outreach and education um, we want people to be able to have access to the information that they need to make the decisions that are best for them and their families. Having said all that, uh, have you found that there are people who, regardless of how much information that you put in front of them, they just don't believe you? Yes. Um, simply by being a scientist and, and working at a university, uh, that disqualifies me, um, uh, even though I'm, a, I'm an expert in marine contamination, it disqualifies me as a source of information for, for, for some people. And um, I think that's unfortunate. But when we look at many issues related to scientific inquiry, inquiry and, and scientific uh, research, like climate change, uh, like vaccines, uh, like reproductive technology, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and mistrust and uh, rejection of evidence that, that simply don't fit uh, with an individual's worldview. So uh, it's a problem that, that's important because many of the problems that we face as a society uh, rely on evidence-based policy and, and science uh, really uh, brings a lot to the table in that respect. And so uh, one of my goals is to, through my own research and, and, and outreach, uh, improve science literacy and, and um, you know, uh, bring information to people that they need. Is it fair to say, though, given how utterly devastating this incident was in Japan, is it fair to say that you were surprised at how small the traces of radioactivity you found off the coast of BC. I think that the potential for this disaster to have been much more uh, impactful and, and, and risky uh, for our marine ecosystem and public health here in Canada, um, there was potential there. And in the early days, as I said, I and other colleagues were really quite concerned to, to try to understand what was going on at, at the plant itself. And there wasn't a lot of information or a lot of good information coming out of the Japanese authorities initially. And so uh, there was real cause for concern. And I think in, in a lot of ways, uh, we've really uh, dodged a, a bullet here with respect to the levels of contamination that we're seeing. It could have been a lot worse. And the fact that we're seeing the levels that we are means that the risk is quite small. But again, um, it, it could have been much different, I think. In which case, take us back overseas. How is, seven years later, the cleanup at Fukushima proceeding? It's uh, the, the technology required to clean up the site is, is still being developed. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, the workers at the plant took new pictures with cameras of damaged fuel in unit number two at the site. Um, but the levels of radioactivity and ionizing radiation are so high inside the damaged reactors that it, it kills electronics, it kills robots, and human beings simply can't go in there. And so to find where the fuel is is, is the first task, and uh, eventually uh, the plan is to try and contain that fuel. And it's not clear how long that's going to take, but it's going to take a long time. And also on the site, uh, there are uh, very large tanks of contaminated water um, that groundwater has been moving through the damaged plants and coming in contact with damaged fuel. And so this water is quite radioactive. We don't know exactly what the levels of some of the isotopes we need to be concerned about are in these tanks. And there are talks of disposing of that water into the Pacific Ocean. And so uh, there's a lot about what's going on at the plant that, that's still concerning. And by no means is the disaster still over. We still measure contamination coming from the plant into the coastal ocean today. Okay, let me, let me just follow up on that because I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. Is the mm -hmm. plant still leaking radioactivity into the ocean? Absolutely. So um, my colleagues uh, who, who go quite close to the plant to, to take samples and to look at the levels in, in seawater find that uh, the levels of these human-made isotopes that can only come from Fukushima are, are still 100 times higher than they were uh, before the accident occurred. So uh, the, the levels and, and the rate at which the leak uh, is occurring and that these isotopes are being put into the coastal ocean is much, much smaller than it was at the beginning of the disaster, but the leaks continue. Now, you pointed out radiation is concerning because you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. But there would be, I presume, I guess what you guys call flotsam and jetsam, right? Uh, objects, um, you know, things that you can see. 
that have made their way into the water and presumably uh, gone with the tide over to British Columbia. What, what kind of things did you find? Well, all along the coast of British Columbia, we're still finding uh, um, material that, that, that's been transported all the way across the Pacific Ocean by, by currents from, from Japan. And some of these items are actually, uh, they have a lot of uh, sentimental value and personal value for people in Japan who, who've lost everything. And so there's been some very fantastic stories about pieces of somebody's home or pieces of somebody's fishing vessel uh, making its way back into the hands of the family who, who've maybe lost them or, or lost their homes. Um, but we, we see everything from bits of uh, docks to whole fishing boats to uh, a motorcycle, which came ashore here uh, on Vancouver Island, if you can believe it. And um, all of that material uh, is being collected. And, and the Japanese government actually funded the removal of some of this material through contracts to individuals who went to remote beaches to try and um, remove this 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 material that that was brought over ultimately after the tsunami by by the North Pacific current there was a motorcycle that made away made its way all the way from Japan to British Columbia intact Th that's so uh, I, I don't believe it it was uh, capable of running anymore but uh, it made it all the way hmm. amazing uh, okay in our last minute and a half here let me just ask you about what the long-range plans for the Fukushima site are I mean presumably this thing's a dead duck in terms of ever producing power again, but do they ever plan to rehabilitate the land where Fukushima was? They're actively trying to decontaminate the site, and, and some of the steps that they've taken um, is to actually pave over exposed areas to try and prevent the spread of contaminated soil and material. Um, they've actually laid down concrete in the inner harbor uh, of the plant uh, at the seaside again, to try and prevent the spread of contamination from marine sediments that are in the harbor. Um, similarly, in Fukushima Prefecture, there's there's a lot of effort being put into uh, removing contaminated topsoil. Um, but the plans for what to do with that material and, and ultimately what's to be done with the site, uh, it's going to be highly radioactive there for a long, long time. And it's fundamentally different from what we've been talking about here, the risk along the coast of British Columbia, uh, because of this ocean-borne contamination. And as I said before, the technology to do the job and to actually uh, contain the fuel and to remedy the site uh, doesn't really exist at this point. And um, going forward, that job is going to be a very difficult job. And the stakes are quite high. There is the potential to uh, recontaminate and, and to spread some of the contamination on-site, off-site. And uh, it's a very difficult job. They've been at it for seven years. How many more do you think it'll take before this project is truly done? Um, I've heard estimates as as many of uh, as many as forty years, and but as I said, I I certainly wouldn't uh, wager uh, anything on 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 a solid timeline. It's a it's an incredibly difficult situation. Understood, and we understand it better now. Thanks to your being on our program tonight, Jay Cullen from the University of Victoria. It's good of you to join us on TVO. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me, Steve. It was a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.